podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, Friday, April 29th, 2011. Happy birthday to my sister, Meg. Tech News Today is brought to you by FreshBooks, the easy online invoicing service that gets you paid quickly and makes you look professional. Get started with a free package at FreshBooks.com. And by Trim Tonic, a natural appetite suppressant tonic that makes the edge come off of being hungry. Visit www.TrimTonicWithAQ.com for more information and enter the coupon code TWIT for a 20% discount. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. And this is the show where that's it. Yeah. Hi, uh, <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Say hi there. I, you know, I should have said, and I'm Sarah Lane, but I'm just used to. I'm in a different. I'm in Tom's chair. It's like bizarro world around here. It is. Uh, first of all, I as Actar did help. Uh, uh, Pick stories for the show. Did a lot of work on the show today, but he's feeling a little under the weather. Uh, so he's in the chat room. We told him not to speak. Save his voice. Uh, but uh, we do have Veronica Belmont with us today. Woo-hoo! Thank goodness. Hello. Raise the roof. That's my best, that's my best queen mother imitation. Hello. Well, I just, I wave. Uh, co-host of Techzilla, uh, host of Core on the Sony PlayStation Network, and uh, all-around good friend of the show. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks, Thanks for, for having uh, us. For joining us. I'm actually on Skype today uh, because I'm in Honolulu uh, as a guest of a Mac users group, the uh, Honolulu Mac and Apple User Society. If anybody's watching this live or even before Saturday morning, it's open to the public. Uh, so check it out, HMAUS. Do uh, uh, H-M-A-U-S, do a, a search for it. You can come and hang out with a bunch of Apple users. It should be fun. Sounds great. Let's start off with a story about Google getting sued over location data. It's like Groundhog Day like just put in X sued over location data and you've got the stories of the entire week. Uh, Google is now being sued by two Michigan women, Julie Brown and Kayla Molosky. They filed their suit in U.S. District Court in Detroit seeking class action status. They want $50 million and they want to stop Google from selling phones with software that can track a user's location. Did they this just is an get outrage. confused? I, oh, I feel like, I mean, they're, they, their lawyer um, throws in the word stalking as, you know, a, a potential issue. But it's like, if they're worried about getting stalked, then they could turn off location features. But they want to stop Google from selling phones to anybody who may not have a problem with this, which seems a little selfish on their part, I've got to say. Now, Google did acknowledge last week that it collects location information, including GPS, current location, timestamps, nearby Wi-Fi networks, all of that stuff, when you opt in. It's not opt out. It's opt in. Mm -hmm. If you say, turn my location services on, it will collect that stuff anonymously and compile it uh, to help them figure out a map. Similar to what Apple was saying, that cache of location information that was discovered uh, was for. It's to to help improve the connection experience. That's what what these guys say, anyway. Uh, It's not traceable to a specific individual, according to Google, but everybody's location crazy afraid these days and and so you're going to get these kind of lawsuits i have a feeling 50 million like dollar lawsuit it just seems like a lot of paranoia to me um i i mean the whole thing with apple that that was a little more justified i think because there was information that was being uh, collected that we didn't really realize we were opting into. You know, we realized when we opt into a lot of the location stuff that we know where that information is going. We kind of understand that it helps us use the apps that we're downloading. Um, But for this one, it is all opt-in. There doesn't seem to be any kind of weird secret information that's going out anywhere. So do you think they have any kind of case here? I don't think so. Unless they can uncover something that we're unaware of. Uh, where Google is collecting information without the opt-in. Let's say you, you say no, and there's still some information that gets collected. Uh, otherwise, I, I can't see they have a case. But that isn't stopping the fear from spreading. Oh, no. Uh, Representatives Joe Barton and Edward Markey of the U.S. Congress have asked the four main U.S. wireless carriers to explain their policies for collecting and storing data. When did you stop tracking people? Uh, The carriers all have said they seek subscribers' consent before tracking their location, but they said, hey, we don't make third-party apps. Third-party apps track people. It's not our fault. This is why we wanted to be in control of everything in the first place. You start letting openness happen and people just putting any kind of app they want on their phone, you're going to get this kind of stuff. 
It's funny, Representative Markey says, uh, despite the carriers saying, listen, uh, you know, we don't sell personal information, we request customer uh, consent before we, before we access location data, always. He says, and this is kind of indicative, Veronica, of what you're saying is, it's just, it's, it sounds like a lot of paranoia. He says, well, I'm still just fell with, with a feeling of easing, easing, uneasiness and uncertainty, and, and people need to be held accountable, which is like, it no, just sounds like you be, don't you know what's going on. You people need to be educated yeah. about exactly what you're opting into and what services you're using that are tracking your information. If you say yes, that's what it's going to do because that's how the application works. Um, like I said, the Apple thing, I, you know, I don't even really remember how that was. What did Steve Jobs say? Like, no, we're not using this at all, but that information is just there anyway, but some one guy did it. or I don't remember what his excuse was. Silly excuse for the for the cached information. You mean yeah. on the phone? They they said that that is uh, meant to improve the ability to uh, to find a connection fast and use a good connection. And it's a subset of crowdsourced data. It's not tracking any individual, uh, but it should be cleared out if you turn off location services. And it wasn't said it was a bug. Mm, okay. Yeah. I don't know. This just all of this sounds silly. It's it reminds me a lot of when um, when people start talking about like near field communication devices and they get mm. worried that their information is being passed on to to people who would use it for um, bad purposes. And that whole fear in, in this country has kept us from using that kind of technology for a really long time while it's been very successful and popular in places like Japan. It seems like that same kind of irrational fear where people don't understand how a technology works and so they just flip out and assume that they're being taken advantage of. And then we end up with silly stuff like a warning label uh, that Verizon is apparently going to put on their devices. Uh, this via phone scoop and gadget also reporting it. it says remove before use. This device is capable of determining its and therefore your physical geographical location. That's a <laughs> it's great like, really? sticker. Do we need this? I guess we do. Well, I given, think given uh, all of the events of this week. Honestly, I think if it's going to stop class action lawsuits against uh, Google and Verizon and you know phone makers, where people say, "Hey, I had no idea." It's like put the sticker on the phone, and then you know what you're buying. It's not going to deter me. I I read this and I'm like, "Yeah, I know how phones work. I have a smartphone on purpose." Yeah. I like maps and things like that. Warning, this phone is able to make calls. <laughs> right. Do you want this? You wouldn't have to put that on an AT&T iPhone. Uh, oh, good one, Tom. Very good. Sneaky. The chat right, room's already mad because I said it was Steve Jobs' silly excuse. Um, uh, it was kind of, you know, I don't know. It could have been worded better, in my opinion. In your own opinion about yourself, my, you've already said you've person. already no, said yourself. No, his his way it. could have been worded a little bit better, but anyway, she's fine with the way she worded it. I'm fine. Oh, I, I see. Say what I see. Say what I feel like I'm I'm drunk on kombucha. It doesn't matter. <laughs> All right. Well, our next story obviously uh, is is a big story. The PlayStation Network uh, outage continues. Uh, we've got some new information about credit cards and uh, some offers from Sony to to at least try to partly make up for the outage. But I know because you do core on the PlayStation Network, you you probably have a conflict. That you need to recuse yourself from the discussion, right? So I can go take a nap now for a little while, Yeah, right? go lay down, you know, okay. drink some more kombucha. Don't drink too much kombucha. We You'll need get you for drunk. The next, I'll, I'll go easy on it. Need you for the story after this. Uh, so uh, so here's, here's the deal. Kevin Stevens, a security expert with Trend Micro, said in a, a tw post on Twitter today, he had seen discussions in online forums in which purported hackers were offering to sell a database of 2.2 million Sony customer credit card numbers stolen during the PlayStation Network attack. Um, they allegedly offered Sony the chance to buy the data set back, but Sony declined. And internet security blogger Brian Krebs noticed similar activity and has posted screenshots of chat room uh, discussions. The FBI is in on this. The FBI has finally said, look, we're aware of reports concerning the alleged intrusion to the Sony online game server. Uh, this is Special Agent Daryl Foxworth speaking to Kotaku. We are presently reviewing the available information in an effort to determine the facts and circumstances concerning the alleged criminal activity. So the FBI on the case, Sony's still saying, look, credit card information was encrypted. We don't think it was uh, stolen, but we can't be sure. And now these hackers come out and say, hey, we've got it. This could be one of two things. Either the information was stolen and they're trying to sell it off or uh, they're, they're fraudsters of their own and they're trying to hoodwink somebody into paying them for a bunch of bunk data. Yeah, and what's, what's kind of interesting about this is even if you uh, – 
if it sounds like, hey, they've, they've got credit card information. Sony did explicitly say, we don't think anyone's credit card information was taken, but even if it was, what they didn't get was that security code on the back of the card. These hackers are saying, no, we do have that. So yeah. that's already a discrepancy, which makes it sound a little fishy in my opinion. I also just, yeah, I'm kind of fascinated by the whole underground internet information trading black market, you know? And it's, I yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it's not like you, you know, you steal a diamond necklace, and what, what do you, who are you going to sell it to? Because eventually, there's someone's going to be like, "That's a diamond necklace that was stolen from the Louvre, and you're going to jail for life." It's like this is all information that can change hands for money, and it's hard to track these people down. Although I find it hard to believe also that somebody called up Sony or somehow got a hold of Sony and said, "Hey, you want your information back? Let me five million. And Sony said, nah. it, yeah, it, it, it's not an insurmountable problem to contact Sony uh, through a secure channel and offer to give the data. But why would Sony even believe that you'll delete it if they paid you? I mean, that's just that's just ridiculous. So yeah, that's a good point. I, I'm still I'm still I can't believe uh, I, I I still have no opinion on whether that credit card information is safe or not. Uh, with Sony saying for sure that they don't know. <laughs> in other words, they're not saying anything for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and with these reports, we got another report from Satchmo who emailed us yesterday, said he did a follow-up call to Citibank, and uh, the phone rep said they had been sent a list of affected credit cards from Sony and that he didn't need to do any more uh, to alert them about the potential uh, PlayStation hacking. Now, that, doesn't, that isn't an admission that the database has been stolen, but it, if it's true, it would mean that Sony is taking some proactive steps because they're not sure. Right. Uh, and that makes sense to me. Also, the other side of this story, uh, our dear friend Patrick Siebold, uh, who has been typing his fingers to the bone on the Sony PlayStation blog, has put up another Q&A. Uh, it says that they are working to restore all the PlayStation Network data when they bring the service back online after the rebuild. Your download history, your friends list, your settings, your trophies, all that stuff that has been stored in the cloud is not affected. It will be restored to your account. At least that's what he said. Mm -hmm. uh, and to thank players for their patience, they will be hosting special events across the game portfolio. They're also working on a make good plan for players of the PS3 versions of DC Universe Online and Free Realms. Uh, and they'll have more details soon about all of the different ways. But they said, look, we're evaluating ways to show appreciation for your extraordinary patience as we try to get these services back online because it's been over a week now. What are they doing, like user group tests? Do you feel appreciated? We're evaluating <laughs> the best way to show our appreciation. We'll let you know as soon as we've found the best way. As your feeling of appreciation rises, turn this dial this way. If your feeling of appreciation <laughs> falls, actually, that's, that's, that's chocolates. That's, 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 uh, that's, not, not a good way to show appreciation. Um, yeah, I move on and bring Veronica back to the conversation. The Amazon finally coming out and apologizes about it. Uh, hey, Tom, why don't you start that sentence again? Because your audio is cutting out a little bit. Excuse me. In fact, now your video's cut out a little bit too. See, you only okay. Now you're see yeah. You seem to be back now. Maybe I think you're I think uh, I think Eileen must be downloading torrents. Well, she's, she's been torrenting she's again. Like, she's like, no, I'm not doing anything. <laughs> All right, uh, Amazon uh, posting a detailed uh, explanation of the outage that, that I thought was very good. I mean, the, the first it of is all, they extremely apologize. detailed. Mm-hmm. They, uh, they apologize and they say uh, that they uh, they think that communication was one of the worst things they did during the outage and they want to improve on that. I think it's great that they don't talk down to their customers. It's nice to see a company actually giving like specific information about exactly what went wrong and how they're planning on fixing it instead of just being like, oh, things aren't working so hot. You know, we'll let you know when things are better. It's nice to see someone that they're actually, you know, respecting their customer's intelligence in that way. Well, they're also um, not outing an, em an employee who apparently was was directly involved in, in the network outage that happened. You know, a lot of people thought, well, is this some sort of automated issue? And, and it was just a problem that nobody could have foreseen. Apparently, uh, as Amazon puts it, the configuration change was to upgrade the capacity of a primary network. During the change, one of the standard steps is to shift traffic off of one of the redundant uh, routers to the primary EBS network to allow the upgrade to happen. The traffic shift was executed incorrectly. And rather than routing the traffic to the other router on the primary network, the traffic was routed routed onto the lower capacity redundant EBS network. So, so, so the employee who's like, ah, wrong switch, 
darn it, is like yeah. FML, but at least we don't have to, you know, throw rocks at him or her. And that, and that's what caused all the problems because once it got to that secondary router, it couldn't handle the traffic. And all this stuff happens in split seconds, right? Right. So the swamped connections disconnected the primary and secondary networks from each, each other, isolated all these different nodes. And when the connection was restored, when they're like, oh, crap, we need to put it back on the primary connection, all of these nodes started to try to... To I try to lock up. Lost. Poor Tom. We lost Tom's nodes. I want to know, that's, Tom. That's not a euphemism. What are you going to say next? Oh, that's such a... Okay, he actually... His, his call actually dropped. Poor Tom. I, he, he was on a roll, too. To, uh, Veronica, Tom has been doing um, some ranty stuff lately on TNT. When he really gets going, you know how he's... You can start seeing kind of like the sparks fly off of him. Ah, well, I'd feel more bad for him if he weren't dropping his calls in Hawaii right now. Yeah, exactly. Poor Tom. Yeah. Well, that actually is uh, something that, that Tom isn't uh, very happy about. He almost hates the to travel because of this sort of thing. Reach. <laughs> so uh, while, while we're trying to get Tom back onto the show, uh, Veronica, it sounds like you have a lot of respect for the way that Amazon handles not just customer service in general, but things like outages and confusion. You know, some people have have um, taken them to task a little bit for um, not coming out with this information sooner. I mean, uh, you know, Sony, Sony's going through the same stuff right now, but they certainly have, um, I think, given us all the information that they could possibly ever tell us and then some. So oh, definitely, yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of a Hodgman. More information than you could possibly require, I guess, in some senses. Um, but I do think that it's good that they're getting all that information out there at the same time, kind of putting it together in one cohesive place where people can go and read and figure out what's going on. Um, because I'm sure you guys talked about it constantly on the show, but that outage really affects a lot of consumers and a lot of uh, customers that use their services. And it was pretty unprecedented in a lot of ways. Ways. And I'm glad that it's, you know, it's, it's coming around and they're providing that credit and they're kind of making up for the downtime. Um, so I say good on, good on Amazon for that. All right. Well, we're trying to get Tom back on the show. We should take a moment to thank FreshBooks.com. Veronica, you said before the show that you had not heard about FreshBooks. So get ready to be impressed because if you are a consultant, uh, or for whatever reason you need to invoice a company, you need, you know, you've, you've done some work for them and you need them to pay you, well, there's a process. Company has to have social security number information and, and what, you're char uh, what you're charging them and, and a variety of stuff. And that can be really cumbersome, especially if you're handling more than a few jobs. FreshBooks.com is the way to invoice professionally with a variety of companies. There's no limit on how many people you work with. Um, if you don't like invoicing, and trust me, if you've never invoiced on a regular basis, it's really not that fun. No, like you, you don't like invoicing? No, not a, no. Not a big fan? No, it's like doing my taxes all year long. I mean, I like getting money, <laughs> but the process of getting money can be very cumbersome. FreshBooks.com will do all of that for you. Um, there's a variety of ways that you can hook up with companies to get paid, you know, PayPal, credit card. You can even have um, your, your invoices snail mailed to the company and... and and uh, your money sent back, if that's the way that either you or they prefer to do business, FreshBooks is really, really flexible in that way. And they make your, they make your invoices professional. They also will, um, they'll help kind of, you know, strong arm the folks into to paying you if you're uncomfortable doing that yourself because that's not a conversation everybody likes to have. FreshBooks will, um, they, can, um, they can set up with companies to, to bill you hourly so they can actually keep track of the, the work you're doing so that you can be paid. And it's all there. It's all, you know, in a nice spreadsheet. It's nothing that you have to think about. They can also remind companies, hey, you know, it was due on October 5th, friendly mm. reminder from FreshBooks kind of thing. And if you have three clients or fewer that you're working with regularly, it's free. You can use FreshBooks.com absolutely free. And the prices are really reasonable uh, for folks who actually do a lot more uh, work with a variety of clients and maybe have 10 or 20 or 100 or whatever. We love FreshBooks. Um, Amber MacArthur is actually the first person who turned me on to FreshBooks because she is like the contract queen. She works with every company under the sun, certainly all of the companies <laughs> in Canada. Uh, FreshBooks.com is the URL. Check them out. They're great. Um, we love working with them. Tom's used them. And uh, we thank them so much for sponsoring TNT today. Speaking of Tom, it appears that he's calling us back. I wonder if he'll appear. 
Tom, Huzzah. are you with us, Tom? He's saying in the chat room that he has no sound. Oh. So. Okay. He has no sound. Um, I'm going to have to check out that FreshBooks thing because I use Expensify right now because it has a really great iPhone and iPad app and you uh -huh. can just like connect a credit card with that. And I, I mean, don't mean to keep talking about your ad, um, but it is kind of interesting because I am a contractor and I do invoice a lot. So maybe I'll check that out. If it's easier than Expensify, we'll see. It sounds so, pretty good. So Veronica, have you read uh, this, this? There was a TechCrunch article. It was actually a, um, a guest post from Michael Robertson who's who's a digital music business veteran. Um, he's the former CEO of mp3.com. He's the current CEO of mp3 tunes. And he wrote out a, a really interesting um, kind of play by play on, on Amazon's cloud music service. And the fact that obviously the record labels are not happy about Amazon not having deals with, with them. Um, and what they will be demanding of Amazon based on his knowledge of these sorts of things, because he's in a in the middle of uh, MP3 tunes is in the middle of a lawsuit right now uh, mm -hmm. about this very thing. And it's interesting. I mean, Universal Music Group, uh, Sony, Warner Brothers, everyone's got these different needs, uh, for lack of a better word, um, for what they would require of Amazon. Um, Universal Music is concerned that pirated tracks uploaded to a locker um, is, is it, you know, will be like laundering, you know, people will, will be sharing them back and forth. Right. They I think this is super interesting because not only are they worried that people are going to just upload their music to these lockers, but they're worried that people are going to be uploading music that was originally pirated up to these lockers. So they want some kind of tracking system like a UITS that, you know, like iTunes has been inserting email addresses into songs and other retailers have different ways of kind of tracking songs that are bought on their networks or are from them. And you also can't get any kind of tracking if you are ripping from CDs. Exactly. So that is a really interesting point because you own this music. Right. And he's saying that people shouldn't be able to upload music from their own ripped CDs into the cloud space. Yeah. That seems kind of it, ridiculous to me. Exactly. I mean, it really defeats the purpose of having your music in the cloud if music that isn't, I mean, it's... You could almost think of it as a form of DRM. I mean, I didn't realize that uh, iTunes had my email address somewhere in, in my music file. I don't really care that they do, but if that keeps me from being able to upload um, my ripped, oh, I don't know, 400 CDs that you know I have in my music collection over the years because there's no way to confirm that I didn't steal them, that's not very helpful. Um, it would almost be nice if you could just add an identifier yourself. Exactly. You know, if you if you ripped a bunch of stuff, fine. If you're going to be tracking me anyway, I want to be able to use my music the way I want to use it. So here, fine. I'll attach my iTunes email ID to all my MP3s that I've ripped. If that'll really make you happy. Yeah. I don't know. Is there some kind of like compromise that people can use? It, it doesn't seem fair to not let you be able to use that music that you've ripped. I think it's in the first it, place. It, yeah. It, this is sort of the the record labels. It's not that they don't understand how technology works. I think a lot of times you hear people say, they don't know what's going on. They're so behind the times. It's like they just don't want to relinquish control because they're so worried about piracy. Sony, uh, they want their music loaded onto one computer only. This is their way of, of, of people uh, getting around people trading music. One computer only, so you can't go to your friend's house and... Uh, download your music there and then share it with them. One emergency download of lockered music. So that's like if people say, listen, there was a fight, you know, I lost all my files for whatever reason. Then Sony's like, okay, well, we don't want to be total jerks, but you can only re-download once. And then after that, you're definitely pirating music and, and selling it on the black market. So that's... I don't know. One computer only kind of stuff is, well, that does sound behind the times to me. Yeah, we should all just use streaming services anyway. You know, all this, all this holding on to media for the whole time, just you know, I'm starting to lose faith in the whole idea in general. Warner Music is worried about multiple lockers shared to friends, and they want a central locker authority to administer locker assignments. <laughs> and all of these labels, by the way, want an annual per user fee. So it's the sort of thing where it's like, <laughs> I mean, Amazon has got, there's, there's no way that this makes any sense for Amazon to continue their cloud music service if they're going to have to put all these restrictions in place in order not to get sued and taken down by the record labels because it doesn't make financial sense to them uh, to be paying an annual per user fee 
if this is a service that they're providing their users. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's the whole thing is kind of a mess. It makes me not even like music anymore. Really? No, I'm just joking. So you it is frustrating though. Yeah, it is. Uh, you say uh, streaming streaming music is the way to go. That's what I'm always saying. What is, what are your streaming music uh, favorites these days? I, I'm all over RDO right mm -hmm. now. I've been using it for the past six months or so. I love it. Um, pretty much all my music is on there now. I've, I've pretty much stopped using iTunes at all for things other than podcasts, really, at this point, and videos. Um, but I, I have all my music syncing to my iPhone using the RDO app, and mm -hmm. the music just lives on there. I can download it to the device, and the quality is pretty good, and you don't need to have a connection if you have uh, one of their subscription plans where you can add music to your collection. Tom, so, yeah, you're back with us now, and Veronica Yay. and I were just kind of talking about the silly restrictions. I mean, the record labels obviously don't think they're silly, but, uh, but, but all the ways that this is just going to sort of kill Amazon's, any fun that the Amazon cloud service could provide to users. <laughs> You with us? I don't think I you see can hear him. us. No, it's, it's not even just about that. I, I, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. I think there's just a lag. You're, you're laggy, McLaggerson. Okay, yeah, so my... Oh, oh. God, he's horrifying looking. Yeah, the, it looks like WiMAX went out in Honolulu because I have two 4G connections that are gone. Oh, wow. Uh, so you might want to just put me on uh, audio only. Let's do that. Not that we don't want to see your beautiful face, because we do, but we'd, uh, we'd rather hear your expert opinion. Uh, yes, anyway, we probably, probably spent too much time on this story already, but essentially this is just uh, the, in fact, if you want to hear an explanation of this, watch our triangulation episode with Michael Robertson, who wrote the story for TechCrunch, because he explains what's really motivating uh, the music industry to do this sort of thing. They actually do get it, in his opinion. They understand that this is ridiculous and this is not the way the Internet's meant to work, uh, but they, they want to use it as leverage. They want to make money, and they feel like if they can get the law on their side and force ridiculous analogs to old-fashioned physical behavior to exist in this idea of like, oh, you can only have one copy of a song in one locker, even though everything's infinitely copyable, then maybe we can, uh, we can actually get all of this stuff to work. Absolutely. Let's move on to uh, Microsoft. But yeah, let's move on to uh, Microsoft. Uh, biggest one-day fall since 2009 almost happened. It rallied again at the end. Uh, but Microsoft, after their uh, positive revenue, beating analyst expectations, making money, down 3%, $25.92 a share. Uh, Apple now rakes in not only more value. Apple, we, we knew, was the most valuable U.S. tech company at $321 billion. Microsoft second at $225 billion. But now Apple rakes in more in sales and net income. Microsoft posted net income of $5.2 billion. Apple recorded, reported net income of $6 billion. You know, it's funny. Just yesterday we were talking about, I mean, you were pretty excited, Tom, about App, or Apple's Microsoft's earning call and how they beat analyst expectations and everything's on the up and up and you were you were kind of uh, curious as to why Ayaz and I were like yeah but but um, it's it's funny how the you just throw a bunch of numbers together and you change your story and the whole thing's different now Microsoft's down Apple's up what happened to to, to their great earnings. Reports. So it sounds like the Xbox actually, um, what, what's the deal with the profit margin with the Xbox? Is it too expensive to make and they're not selling it for, for high enough to make up that difference? Bueller? No, they're actually making a lot of money on the Xbox and the Kinect. Uh, the, it, the, those are the bright spots. It's, uh, it's just the... People are buying people. Well, no, it says, but investors were concerned with lower personal computer sales nagging at Windows, Xbox sales bringing down profit margins, and losses in its online business, as being some of the main reasons for the uh, stock drop. Tom, you there? Oh, boy. Did we lose Tom again? No, we didn't. Oh, Tom. No! no! Uh, I mean, I, I know that, Veronica, uh, based on the, the, the earnings reports from yesterday, the Connect Xbox uh, portion of Microsoft had, had seen the most, gr well, obviously the most growth because there wasn't a Connect uh, before last year. But, I mean, that was sort of the surge in earnings for Microsoft. And, you know, Windows 7 is, is, is 
new as well mm -hmm. is growing, you know, and it'll continue to grow. Um, but it's, there's also, you know, you look at the, the Bing portion of Microsoft, and, I mean, Bing's kind of everywhere, but they're not making a lot of money off of that. It's just, it's, uh, I still have a little bit of a problem, um, I, I hate to say apples and oranges, but there's so much of this comparison between Apple and Microsoft and the fact that Apple is beating Microsoft in revenues and profits and, and this and that. And it's like, they just seem like different companies to me with different philosophies. They've been doing things differently for a long time. And mm -hmm. it's, it's like a, I know Microsoft can, can hold its own and they don't need to be, you know, I don't need to be feeling sorry for them, but I feel sort of like it's very easy to um, use Microsoft as a punching bag just because Apple's doing well. We have an interesting comment from Lou M.M. in the chat room who says, I work at Microsoft. Uh, this is a given for us. Every year we report our great earnings and bam, stock drops. Why? People sell thinking we are at our high. And then he went on to say, where is his second half of his comment? Um, he says, Win 8 is coming, Xbox, Win, Win, Windows Phone 7, and more and more and more. It never stops. Apparently, the better things get, the harder the stock falls during the earnings call. Tom, are you back with us? I know you really want to go to the beach, but we still have some show to do. <laughs> no? I thought you said he was back, Alex. No? We can't hear you, Tom. <laughs> that face in the picture is classic. Yeah. yeah. That's actually, I would like to say that that's the face that he would actually be making right now, but I think it's probably a little bit angrier. Yeah, that, I think that's our picture from uh, Dragon Con, a panel at Dragon Con, but I could be wrong. Oh, yeah. No, that, that sounds about right. So while we're waiting to get Tom back on, let's move on to Twitter and advertising. Because Twitter has been experimenting with advertising for quite a while now. But mm -hmm. they've started to experiment with new text ads. This is on, on their, their web experience. So um, right. it's, it's under in the, obviously you have to be using new Twitter. Everybody has that now. Except that that weird outage, what was it, a couple of weeks ago where we all, all got old Twitter for like 24 hours? And I didn't even notice because I almost never used the Twitter web experience. Really? You say. Yeah, so I, I didn't even know what had happened until I saw people writing about it. I thought that was kind of funny. Um, yeah, this is cool. It's interesting. I don't know if cool is actually the right word. Um, but the problem I think people are having out. is that they're not showing up as like quote unquote ads. Like there's no notification that you are looking at an ad other than if you're looking in the HTML code on the page. Um, it doesn't bother me, but I can see why people would get confused and feel kind of like cheated into clicking something they didn't mean to click on. Um, Though I think the way they're written is kind of advertorial sounding anyway. Yeah, they sound addy. Uh, Tom, are you back with us now? Do you, you hear me now? now? Yes, Ben, you're very echoey. Yeah, yeah. well, that's because I'm on my uh, laptop mic. There's I... multiple failures going on. Yes, uh, yes, <laughs> you're, you're really in meltdown mode there in Hawaii. We can't hear you now, though. Uh, so we're, uh, we're talking Twitter advertising and, and whether it's, um, it's shifty or if it just makes sense. Uh, you know, I, I think it should be called out as an ad. I don't like the fact that it's just kind of put over there. But other than that, I think it's the right idea. Uh, that it looks like they're doing the same sort of stuff that they do with promoted tweets and, and, uh, and, and the other accounts, which is content. You're putting in a hashtag. They're putting in things that fit inside of Twitter so that it's not just this weird thing that's totally out of context and totally clashes with the rest of Twitter. I guess that's an argument for not calling it out as an ad so that it's very subtle and just blends in. question is, are people going to click on it? Yeah, I mean, I mean they, they could ahead, just Brian, say promoted go. next to it the way they have it, uh, promoted hashtags. Yeah, I think that their reasoning for why they're not calling it out as an ad is that they're under the... Um, the, uh, what's the word for them? The trends, the trends area. So at the top of the trends, we're all used to a promoted tweet that's at the top of trending, which, you know, they say promoted next to it. But I think that they kind of go, well, it's not right at the top, so we're not really lying to anybody. It's down at the bottom. It kind of seems like part of trends, but it's actually an ad space. And yeah, I'm with you, Veronica. It looks like an ad to me. And I'm sure that some people will be confused and click on it by accident, wondering if there's something going on uh, and, and, and perhaps realize, oh, this is some sort of um, paid for experience. But that happens on websites and has been going on for quite a while. I mean, people have ads in the middle of blog posts that are confusing to me. I know that Google ads require you to label them as such, but people have very creative ways not to do that or to label them in a way that 
that I don't know makes it look a, a, so much like the site that you actually don't know the difference. So this is this is Twitter. They're trying to make money. I think that we can only expect more of them to at least experiment with this. We know from the quick bar that. If it's upsetting enough and people complain <laughs> loudly enough, then it then it might go away. But they're not going to stop trying to make money. So I think I, we I didn't even have remember what the quick it. bar was actually called until you just said it right now. Yeah, I I I prefer the alternative. But, Me too. You know, it's a family show and all. Family show. All right, let's get let's get on to uh, the biggest story of the day in the world. Yeah. Frankly, uh, you, I, I know everybody was paying attention to this. Uh, she was dressed all in white. Uh, most people thought she just looked beautiful. Oh, she was gorgeous. But sadly, she's a little fat. Fat? Wow, well, you cases. think you think so, Tom? Gosh, I I wouldn't have said that. Why would you say oh, that? Uh, we've seen that, the measurements. She's definitely a little does, fatter. Yeah, the the new one is 0.2 millimeters thicker than the black one. And we're talking about the white iPhone, right? Oh, yeah, no, of course. Yeah, we're talking yeah. about the white iPhone. Yeah, yeah that's and what so I was talking about. There's this big controversy now that cases that are very tight, that have tight tolerances, may not fit the white iPhone, even though all, to all cases are supposed to work on all the iPhones. That's interesting. I haven't had a chance to, I haven't seen the white iPhone. I didn't go to the Apple store yesterday, but um, I have a case that I love. Um, and it's really tight on my iPhone 4, so there is no wiggle room. So No, yeah, I agree with you. I use the Incipio Feather. Sorry to interrupt you. No, it's um, okay. And it's, it's also, it's very, very close to the, to, the, to the lip of the phone there, and I feel like that extra bit of, of stick-outness in the white iPhone's, um, you know, burgeoning waistline <laughs> is, um, it would make a difference in not only the protection of the phone, but also just the fit in general. Yeah, it's, it's it's not. I I guess for some people it's not a big deal. I mean, I know a lot of people who like to go commando with their iPhones anyway. I'm not one of them because I happen to drop mine regularly, and I live in San Francisco, so there's hills that I've actually had iPhones slide down before. So I need a case. I don't particularly want to buy a new case just because I got the white iPhone because I wanted to be different. So kind of an annoyance. It would have been nice to know ahead of time. I, I, I think if somebody wanted a white iPhone badly enough, they could deal with getting another case. Well, isn't this kind of a big <laughs> FU to third party manufacturers of cases and accessories? Yeah. I mean, some of those things, you know, fit as is, like really to the, to the specifications. And I, I wonder how much they've talked to third party, um, you know, case developers and, and accessory developers um, about this issue, if they knew that coming in advance or if they, if they had to find that out the day it came out too. Harvard in the chat room points out you're just getting more iPhone for your money. I guess so. Very good point. Good look at it that way. Very yes. good point. All right, let's move on to the news views. Ah, uh, the royal wedding. We couldn't uh, get through without some acknowledgement because it set a couple of live streaming records today. Livestream.com said it had over 300,000 simultaneous viewers, which is a record for them. Uh, an Akamai representative also said that the wedding beat the 2010 World Cup for most concurrent live streams. Every big live streaming event seems to beat the previous big live streaming event, but uh, looks like a lot of people were watching the British royal family. In fact, probably more people cared outside of Britain than cared inside of Britain, from what I can tell. Yeah, I know a lot of folks, uh, at least who live in London, um, some of them, Tom, we, we have on TNT regularly, we're like, we are getting out of town. We get the day off, and it's a good excuse to have a nice long weekend away from all this nonsense. Um, I didn't actually DVR the royal wedding, so I guess I'll just be content looking at a few pictures online. It's okay with me. Uh, Microsoft stock isn't the only thing that's giving Redmond problems. No, no. Windows Phone 7 updates to the Samsung Omnia 7 have been stopped due to a technical issue. We always love those. Previously, certain Omnia 7s were bricked by a Windows Phone update. Microsoft says it's working on the problem, but there is no timeline yet, and I don't like the sound of it. Uh-oh. Yep. Hey, and if you wanted to use two NVIDIA graphics cards in an SLI config, uh, you'd have to get an Intel motherboard. Those days are over. NVIDIA will license its SLI tech to motherboard makers that use AMD processors. Look at that. Two competitors in the graphic card space learning to play nice together. What a wacky world we live in. Mm -hmm. Intel, however, released some specs for the next rev of its Atom processor, codenamed Cedar Trail. They're trying to get back in that mobile space. 
The CPU and GPU will be a single die based on Intel 32 nanometer technology. The smaller process will let Intel boost clock speeds while conserving, maybe even lowering the power needed to cool it. Cedar Trail will continue to use the same NM10 chipset that Oak Trail does. You can read up more about the specs at anandtech.com. First, Apple sued Samsung over patent infringements relating to the iPhone's look and feel. And then Samsung sued Apple over other patent infringements in several countries. Yesterday, Samsung decided to sue Apple in the U.S. too. And this lawsuit revolves around, may I have a drum roll please? Patents! Patents! Samsung says it has a patent on surfing the web while being on a phone call. That's our patent, which is something that, of course, the GSM iPhone also does. It's kind of what AT&T has going for it. This legal battle is starting to look like a scene from, you know, uh, like a Tarantino movie where everyone's just pointing guns at each other. Who will shoot first? I don't know. They're all going down. They're yeah. all going down. And uh, speaking of Apple, Apple has begun adopting the iCloud name within several products currently under development, suggesting the appropriately labeled moniker is indeed the front runner for the company's soon to debut internet cloud service. Uh oh, we've been talking about that lately today. According to people familiar with the matter, Apple is prepping beta versions of both iOS 5.0 and Mac OS 10 Lion ahead that integrate with iCloud, letting users sync mobile be like data and who knows, maybe music too, if they can get the permission. We should credit Apple Insider for, for passing that along. They know the people familiar with that matter. Particularly. <laughs> uh, Yankees suck your data up and email it out, apparently. Yes. A sales rep for the New York Yankees accidentally emailed a spreadsheet containing account IDs, names, addresses, phone numbers, email addresses, and seat numbers of more than 21,000 Yankee season ticket holders to thousands of clients. All you need is an account ID number and a password to access an account on Yankees.com. <laughs> Rock Bombers have sent a note to season ticket holders apologizing and assuring it will never happen again. 27 rings! <laughs> go Red Sox uh, go Giants world champs uh, Jeff Moss a prominent computer hacker who founded the annual Black Hat and DEF CON security conferences in Las Vegas has been hired as the chief security officer for the organization that coordinates names of the world's websites the domain name system has been in need of a security overhaul and Moss can have a positive effect on those discussions Moss also serves on the US Department of Homeland Security's advisory council and will start his gig on Friday today or next Friday. all right uh let's go on to our second sponsor of the day trim tonic they're a new sponsor uh supporting shows on twitter including tech news today and uh, you might know them as the makers of brain tonic which veronica i know you're very uh excited about mm -hmm. you've, you've you've drank a lot of brain tonic in your time i know i have had a lot of brain tonic in my day it is true not too much recently i haven't bought a new whatever 24 pack Recently, trim. but yeah, I'm, I'm interested in trying the trim tonic. Trim tonic, trim tonic Tom, I, I'm having some right now, and I've got to mm -hmm. say, you know more I do about what's in it, but I can see that there's only two grams of sugar in an entire can. I don't know how that's possible because it's really sweet and yummy. It doesn't taste like yeah, garbage. So the idea is it's a natural appetite suppressant. Uh, it's supposed to take the edge off being hungry. Brain tonic is supposed to stimulate thoughts. Use that. Uh, trim tonic uses no stimulants. As a, a lot of these, these diet things use caffeine, uh, or even something like called Hoodia. Uh, instead, what Trim Tonic does is use eight active ingredients, some of which have clinical studies showing their ability to curb appetite and reduce body fat. The three main ingredients are Acaranthes aspera, Ervingia gabonensis, uh, and seed, uh, seed extracts, both of which are tropical plants used in India and Africa. And the third is coca leaf. Now, you may laugh at that. Uh, but because that means I'm drinking cocaine, doesn't it, Tom? Well, there are about 25 <laughs> varieties of coca, uh, and, and what oh. Trim Tonic does is it combines the five most useful varieties. Uh, there are about 10 to 14 alkaloids in them, and by law, the two illegal alkaloids are removed. It's kind of like decaffeinated co coffee for, for coca leaves. Well, you know, I uh, have to say, although cocaine would be fun, um, it's not really, you know, that doesn't really make a lot of sense, you know, when you have to hold down a job. But no caffeine is also a, a, a good thing for me because I can't drink caffeine in the afternoon. I'll never go to sleep. So, so if you want more uh, information, me visit their website, Trim Tonic, T R I M T O N I Q dot com. Uh, and if you'd like to buy some while you're there, enter the coupon code TWIT and you get a 20% discount. And we thank them for their support of Tech News Today. Yeah, it's On really to the good. count.
The Nexus S 2.3.4 update is now available to early adopters via a manual install. Yay! AT&T Bold 9700 and the Curve 3G users get BlackBerry 6 today. Congratulations, users. AT&T's broadband data caps begin today. Here are the new limits. <clears throat> 150 gigabytes for DSL describers, subscribers. <laughs> if you can subscribe, describe your DSL, that's even better. And 250 gigabytes for UVerse users. I don't like data caps, but that's what they are. HBO Go has hit iOS and Android free for existing uh, subscribers. And, you know, this is a couple days earlier than they were, they were saying May 2nd, May 2nd, because I was paying attention uh, on the iOS side. Uh, so it is not May 2nd. So thanks for giving uh, that to us early, HBO Go. Game Yay! Yay! Amazon has a couple of releases, Samsung rather, Samsung has a couple of releases on Sunday. The Galaxy Tab 10.1V is shipping on Vodafone Australia, I think the V stands for Vodafone, and the Samsung Galaxy S2 will be available in the UK. New limits on Spotify's free service go into effect in Europe on Sunday mm. as well. Most free users will be now limited to 10 hours of streaming per month and only 5 listens per track. That is... I don't know. That's five listens. Come on. We've talked about this before, so I won't go into a rant, but it's like, if I like a song, I want to listen to it uh, a lot more than five times. Space Shuttle launch has been delayed until Monday at the very earliest. Oh, I feel I bad for everyone at the tweet up. No, poor endeavor. It's too bad. Yeah. Um, and on Monday, the NASDAQ rebalancing takes effect. You might remember that Apple will be most affected by the move with its weighting slashed almost in half, though it's still going to remain the largest component of the index. Starting July 1st, Microsoft certification exams are going to cost you $25 more than they, uh, they cost you now. In, in the U.S., it's going from $125 to $150. So... Not a huge increase, but it's an increase nonetheless. It can't be hurting that much after the stock drop. Yeah, well, <laughs> certification exams. We're going to get our money bucks. back somehow. Formula One cars uh, are going to actually be using electric energy or have the capability to use electric energy to coast in and out of the pit lane during races to conserve energy starting in 2013. And boy, are those racing purists outraged already at the thought of F1s breezing by silently rather than guzzling gas and making us deaf because that's what it's all about. Loud We're noises. The I guess I don't have to yell. No, you don't. <laughs> yeah, so the hippies are ruining the fun yet again uh, in Formula One cars. Shoes on, hippies. <laughs> and Intel touts 50 gigabit per second interconnectivity by 2015 and will make that work with tablets and smartphones too. Yippee! Can't wait. It's going to be a good year. <laughs> I don't know if you guys noticed, but uh, Twitter is down hard right now. Really? I noticed it when we were talking about the ad thing, and everyone in the chat room is saying it's all going down for them as well. Not news necessarily, but uh, yeah. it is across the board for everyone. It doesn't happen as often as it used to, so it's new yeah, to be interesting. Yeah, you're right, yeah. though. It's definitely down. Huh, interesting. All right, let's move on to the voicemail. 260TNT show is the number to call. Leave us a short, brief, and interesting message like this gentleman did. Hey, Team Team Show guys, uh, Damien from Melbourne, Australia. We've been talking about um, wireless uh, over the last couple of episodes, uh, having a separate public and a separate private one. Um, we've got a service over here called Tommyzone, T-O-M-I-Z-O-N-E.com. We've been shipping with some link system d -link routers over the past couple of years, and um, it does exactly that. So uh, look it up, guys. Cheers. All right, that's good to know. Also, Andrew in London uh, wrote in and said that BT, one of the major ISPs in UK, operates something similar for the majority of its connections by default. You have to opt out if you don't want it, which I don't like. Uh, but if you remain part of the program, you give up a little bit of bandwidth. In return, you get free access to all their commercial Wi-Fi hotspots and free access to all BT broadband connections, which haven't opted out. So it's this big Wi-Fi network for all BT users. Not exactly totally open, but at least it's, you know, it's a step in that direction. That's awesome. So there's more of this going on that I realized. Yeah, same here. It's good stuff. Uh, next email from Mark in Pasadena who says, you guys seem to have missed the recent Supreme Court ruling affecting class action lawsuits, or maybe I just missed your discussion of it. Um, and he links to a, a Market Watch article that, that talks about how, uh, um, what would be the best way to describe this, Tom, that class action lawsuits are not allowed... Yeah, it's a very it's a very legal story, not a very technical story. But essentially, uh, AT and T puts, uh, like many companies, not just tech companies, puts uh, clauses in the terms of service saying that you won't bring a class action lawsuit. You'll go to arbitration, 
And the Supreme right. Court said, that's fine. Uh, if you agree to that term of service, then you don't, you don't get to go bring a class action lawsuit. So, Mark, Mark says it seems especially relevant given the problem with the PSN. The term class action has come up again and again in your discussions the past few days, but these might soon be a thing of the past. And uh, we, we should point out that if you really want to dig into this topic a little more this week in law with Denise Howell has a uh, discussion of it where they explain everything that's going on, what all the implications are. Uh, you know, class action lawsuits often get a bad rap for being frivolous. Uh, but this actually really undermines the ability to punish companies uh, for things that are really bad. So, that, you know, there is a place for a class action lawsuit, and this kind of throws the balance uh, the other direction. Uh, well, this has been a very interesting <laughs> episode. Uh, th thanks for uh, keep on keeping on, Tom. Hey, no, You're a really good you sport. Thank you and Veronica for, uh, for covering through the middle of the show. You guys are pros. It, it, was, it was awesome. Hey, no problem. We're, we're happy to help. I just want you back in the studio. I don't like it when you're not here because you make me feel weird. I have to sit in your seat and it's like, you know, I feel like I should grow a beard or something. It's just weird. Seat, yeah. Oh, dude, I had to host uh, Texilla last week while, while um, Patrick was away and I had to stand on his side of the desk. Ugh. That was weird. Yeah. I felt like everything was backwards. I was in some kind of crazy mirror world. <laughs> it was uncomfortable. <laughs> well, thanks for being on our show today, Veronica. We Thank you for having, having me as you. always. Yeah, and let folks know uh, about the stuff you're doing uh, and, and where they can find it. Sure. Um, I am on uh, the PlayStation Network on Core every month, and uh, if it comes back up again. And uh, Texilla every week at Texilla.com. All my stuff is linked to from about.me slash Veronica. And Sword and Laser. And, 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 oh, go, oh, right. <laughs> there's another there's the other show at SwordandLaser.com that I do with you. All right. Thanks, everybody, uh, for watching and listening. I will be back in the studio on Monday. Hopefully uh, things will be smoother then. Twitch.tv slash TNT is our website. And you can call us to Cisco TNT Show or email us TNT at Twitch.tv. Really, thank you for listening or watching. We'll talk to you Monday. Back up. Yay! Yay! Let's tweet.